Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar today. Um, so today we are going to talk about uh, how some of the ideas in data science field or data analytics field and how we can actually apply them in the alarm management. So before I start everything, I do need to stress that this uh, particular session of the webinar is also rec recorded uh, for future uses. And today, the day is uh, July the 27th of 2022. So um, if you realize that there's not the right day, that means that uh, you're actually listening to a recorded session. And the reason why I bring this up is because um, I do sometimes re uh, receive emails or questions that seems a little bit frustrated um, that I didn't answer the, the questions during the question session, during the session, um, and mainly because I wasn't actually uh, uh, live in that session, that session was recorded. So really appreciate you guys if you could send me emails when you have any questions. Uh, try to answer as much as I can during the uh, during the whole webinar session. Um, but uh, if this recorded, there's really nothing uh, much I can do other than actually receiving receiving questions from your emails. So so um, a little bit back. A little bit of background about today's topic. Um, I I don't know how you guys are familiar with the idea of alarm management. So one of the core idea, uh, core I would say, the core portion of alarm management is actually about uh, managing alarm data, alarm attribute, and also the ISA standard and also the IEC standard mandates you to upkeep a particular alarm database. And there's not much of a guidance, in fact, in the ISA standard uh, when it comes to how exactly we can um, we can uh, try to navigate and maneuver around how exactly we can upkeep that particular database. Um, so therefore, uh, while I was studying uh, for some for some topics in data science and data analytics, I realized that we can actually basically apply some of the philosophies within the data science or fundamentals within data science and apply that in the alarm management. And it interestingly, they actually fit very, very well in the context of alarm management. And this is going to be one of the series of webinars I plan to do to focus on uh, how exactly we can bridge the discipline of data science and alarm management um, for the for your alarm system, for your control system. And today we will mainly be focusing on the root cause of alarms. So root cause is actually also a very big topic in data science. Um, mostly, when, whenever we talk about data science, we are catering to businesses. So the root cause would mostly be about the root cause of what kind of financial problem or marketing problem that the business is right now experiencing. Um, but the root cause, whenever we talk about root cause in alarm management, we are actually talking about the cause of the alarms, and specifically, what actually started the propagation of the uh, process variables and in the end resulting in the alarms. And today we're going to look at one of the methodology and also how the data scientists or data analyst, uh, analysts handle them using the philosophy of five wires in order to basically derive out and also uh, document the root cause of everything. So um, a little bit about how exactly you can ask questions. So you can type out your questions um, within the GoToMeeting tool. There is a question tool at the right side of the screen. So you can use this mechanism to type out any questions. But during the presentations, um, I 
usually won't be able to look at questions during the session. So what I would do is at the very end of the webinar, uh, we have a Q&A session and I will look at the questions and answer as much as I can. Um, and alternatively, as um, before I started, I, I told you guys, you can also send me emails uh, to ask questions as well. And I will give you my email at the end of the webinar. All right, so let's start digging into it. So a little bit of introduction about me, myself, and also about Exeter. So I'm Paul, my name is Paul Chan, and um, I'm, I'm actually a transfer from uh, the Hong Kong office uh, of Exeter. So the Hong Kong office is part of the Exeter Asia Pacific um, office. So uh, I was transferred about four years ago to the headquarter here in the US, I started with safety with Hazard and also SEAL selection workshop. Uh, I was scribing for Exeter uh, in one of those uh, Hazard and SEAL selection workshop in Seoul in South Korea for three months. And later uh, they realized that um, I could actually be an engineer so that they basically hired me. Because as you can see, my background was that was not actually in engineering, but instead I was raised a biochemist. And then later, actually, I have a Master of Art in English because I was hoping to teach English. But um, you never know what uh, fate has in store for you. And right now I join Exeter and I'm also a certified um, safety professional um, and I also take part in a lot of the risk analysis, like serial verification workshops, um, serial verification the calculations, some of the, a lot of the different alarm management projects, and also a cybersecurity side of it as well. Although I'm more involved in terms of the cybersecurity audits for the time being, instead of a lot of the risk and assessment uh, in the context of cybersecurity, which I do hope that one day I'll be getting more into. So that's about me. Um, and Exeter, we were actually founded in um, just before 2000. Um, and you, as you can see from this map, this world map, we have a lot of different offices scattered around um, in the world. But we are big in terms of we have a lot of experts um, around the world. And we have this focus on functional safety, alarm manage management, and also cyber security. And we are also proud to say that we are very customer focused uh, company. Why would, would we say that? Because our work are evolved around customers. We have our own enterprise tools, Excellentia, and also other modules that goes into Excellentia, um, our own software. Um, we also have um, certification and assessment services to help you to have compliance with ISA, IEC standards. Um, and also we do consulting services like we help you for facilitation for alarm management workshops, alarm rationalization workshops, or help you to build your alarm philosophy, or help you for your hazard and seal selection need, LOPA, and we also do cybersecurity or chairs off those kind of risk assessment. So with all those consulting services, we are also catering towards the customer. And other than that, um, we also publish a lot of books and database. For example, the SERH is basically a database for all the instrumentations um, about their failure rate and how their different failure modes can go in. It is listed within those SERH books. Um, we also have books on cybersecurity, how exactly you can approach cybersecurity based on the IEC 62443 standard, which is a standard cybersecurity standard just for the OT space, the operation technology space. And we also have books teaching you how to do um, risk assessment um, and seal selection um, from Hazard and also LOPA. 
We also have seal verification telling you how to exactly uh, do those PFD average calculations or PFH calculations based on your demand mode. Um, and this is the book for that. And you can understand why we are very proud of the math that we do for seal verification because we are probably the only one company has the tool, Excellentia, to actually do uh, seal verification calculation using Markov Morgan. A little bit more about our certifications. So we have different kinds of certifications. We have uh, certifications for different instrumentations for the OEMs. Um, so that would group into the IEC 61508 certifications. We also have IEC 61511 certifications, which is a little bit more towards the end users um, about how exactly they, how they perform or performing some of the SAT, FATs uh, at the site as some kind of a functional safety assessment. Um, we also have uh, automotive focused uh, certifications according to the ISO 26262 um, and also sometimes uh, for automations that's also related to 26262 as well. Um, we also have cybersecurity certifications, we have personnel um, certifications for as a kind of a uh, for your resume that you, you can show that you have this particular competency to work in the functional safety field. And we are actually the global leader in terms of a lot of the different certifications as well. For example, we have the larger market share in terms of the safety devices certifications and our main uh, competitor, Achoops, which is based in, of course, everyone should know them, based in Germany. Um, and uh, we also have, in terms of the specifically about logic solvers, um, we have uh, overcome a 20 years head start to actually become uh, the leader overtaking Truth and other um, uh, competitors in terms of that. And we also one of the leading uh, leader in terms of the cybersecurity certifications. We actually pioneered that with the ISSA to form an alliance to help uh, people and also different organizations to understand how exactly they can do certifications in that sense in the field or in the context of cybersecurity. And we are really, really proud of that. In fact, we are getting a uh, very big um, customer based in Saudi um, to work on a very big cybersecurity certification project for, them, for the whole site. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have our own software, which is Excellentia. And the most, um, I would say, the most uh, famous part, module of Excellentia should be the silver, silver part of it. Um, because um, silver is probably one of the only uh, software out there actually uses uh, Markov modeling to actually calculate the um, PFD average or PFH and also help you to do a lot of the safe uh, failure rates as well. Uh, but other than Silver, we also have other modules. And we are very proud of the fact that because everything is built into one uh, particular software and with different modules, and as you might uh, be familiar with the IEC 61511 standard, we have a particular life cycle. And to bridge different life part of the life cycle, we need information flows. We have different data flowing between different parts of it. Like, for example, from LOPA, we go into the SRS. So um, what kind of information do we need to actually go into SRS then? So, our tool is actually also built in the view of that, that information from PHAX, for example, what you did in the whole hazard can easily flow into the LOPA X when you try to do the LOPA. And finally, when you try to select your seal selection, you can basically do all, basically import all the maths and data from your LOPA X, and then everything can be automatically populated into the SRS tool. 
where you can actually print out the document of the safety requirement specification. And based on that, you can have all the input information or actually in a way that what kind of test, what kind of level that your SIP needs to pass and then use that as the basis for your SIP replication in that sense. And also, we are very happy to say that, um, very proud as well, to say that we have good integrations with other tools as well. For example, our SEAL Alarm mod uh, module, our SEAL Alarm software has good integration with different control systems like Plant PAX control system or the Amazon's uh, Delta V system as well. And we can import alarm data seamlessly from these control systems. Uh, whenever you control, whenever you create any kind of function blocks with any alarms associated with them, and they can be easily and seamlessly be imported into the SEO alarm tool, where you can basically manage your alarm information. And other than that, we also have OEM targeted uh, tools. Probably uh, because this uh, particular webinar is more focused on the end users, so um, it might not be of uh, much use to you guys, but. Um, it is very useful, especially for the familiar eggs for the OEMs, where basically we are adopting a method the, which is called FEMA from the U.S. military back, which was invented, invented, invented back in the 60s and 50s, I believe, that they tried to investigate failure modes. So we use that to look at how different components within one instrument can actually fail, what kind of failure modes they have, and then try to see how their failure rates would become afterwards. That is the tool for that, for me, the eggs. So that is a brief introduction about Exeter. Now let's go into what we, the main dish of today's topic then. So we want to look at alarms. So why do we actually need the alarm management in the first place then? That was because we see a lot of different alarm problems. For example, so this is the current situation in the industry right now. We have um, different, um, uh, different types of plants, processing plants out there, oil and gas, petrochemical, powers and also some maybe some other processing plants. And what they're facing right now is that uh, they actually have about at least about a thousand alarms per day. And on an average speaking, uh, per 10 minutes interval, they have more than five alarms enunciated to the operator. And these kind of situation is very, very dangerous when you have these kind of alarm overload situation. That's the term that we coined for them. Um, that you basically don't know what these alarms are doing when they come coming at you and that large quantity. And that is creating a lot of the problems in the operation because of that. Um, and these kind of data are not really just uh, some isolated cases. In fact, every single plant that I went to to do alarm rationalization, if they had not performed alarm rationalization or alarm management, they do not have that particular scheme of management in place, they have at least a thousand alarms per day coming at them. And after the alarm rationalization, the number of alarm plumbings in would be dra dramatically reduced afterwards. And this is one of the problem. And one of the most dangerous situation is that at one certain moment, within 10 minutes, you might have a situation where you have hundreds of alarm coming in. And that is the situation whenever you have some kind of upset that would lead to very serious safety consequences like what happened in Deepwater Horizon, where they were facing more than 100 alarm coming in during the incident. And that causes the delay for them to actually hit the emergency evacuation alarm. If they hit it um, 
10 minutes earlier than they actually did, they could have saved lives. There wouldn't be people dying in that particular incident during that situation. So this is a situation that we really want to prevent that is really closely related to safety. And other than alarm floods, we're also, also very often uh, facing a situation where you have a lot of alarm just standing in the background, um, not really knowing what they're trying to do, um, and then they're just catching your attentions and then distracting you, and the operator doesn't even know how exactly what exactly the action is to, in order to clear them. It's like the cat sitting on your keyboard trying to distract you sometimes. So these kind of alarms are called nuisance alarms. One of the nuisance alarms, a nuisance alarm is actually a very big group of problematic alarms, and standing alarms is one of them. Um, and these kind of alarms are usually the ones that without operator actions or without operator actions documented. So therefore, operator's action by documenting them or by knowing them, we can actually eliminate these kind of alarms. Or maybe in the first place, if there's no action for them, maybe we don't even need them. And there's another big problem, which might not sound very serious, but it can be in during dangerous situation. And also it shows a very poor management or poor organization of your alarm system, um, which is the incorrect priority. So incorrect priority is referring to that you have a lot of the alarms, portion of alarms actually at the high priority than the low and mid priority. The ideal priority, according to the standards, the European standard or the ISA standard, is that it should always form like a shape of a pyramid, that with the lowest uh, priority taking up the top of the pyramid, taking up the least portion of all across all your alarms, and um, sorry, uh, the, the highest priority taking the, uh, the least portion of all your alarms, taking up the top of your pyramid and then your lowest priority taking up the most of your alarms. So that in this situation, let's think, um, when you have two alarms coming in, there's a lower chance that you have two high alarm coming in at the same time. Because priority, as it indicates, means that when two, coming, when two different priorities coming in, one lower priority, one high priority coming in at the same time, you should actually prioritize the high alarm rate. So in that case, then, if you have all the alarms as high priority, then there is no point of actually having the priority as an indication for them. So in that case, we actually need to actually use and make good use of this particular tool called priority when in our alarm system then what it means by whenever we have a low priority coming in and high priority coming in, we should always try to handle the high priority alarms in the first place. So, and, um, and there's another big problem, which is the duplicated alarms. Um, these kind of alarms, um, definitely they would clock up your, your screen, like what they are, that is doing right now, that you have high alarms with a series of different um, reactors or even maybe some of the same reactors, but they have different measurement. So these kind of duplicated alarms are usually, um, they usually comes from, I would say, the wrong situation or a wrong presumptions about uh, how alarms should be. There was a philosophy, I would say, maybe borrowing from the common cause factor in the when we think about electronics or uh, instruments uh, from NASA's uh, the, uh, this government that they should also implement some kind of redundancy for alarms as well but human operates differently than the than electronics um, we can only process information more or less one at a time 
the idea of multitasking is basically how the CPU does it, where you shovel one task at the side, and then you do one task, and then you stop one task and then do another task at the same time. Uh, at the other time, so it's like an alternating shuffling time slot that when you, whenever you try to do your multitasking. And that kind of idea comes in whenever you see a redundant alarm, a redundant alarms like that. So the human brain can't really um, process that really well because of that. And it also creates another situation because it's right now clogging up the screen that um, if you have redundant alarms that might come in as a cascade from the top upstream of the process up to the downstream of the process, then in that case that you basically lost, you're basically lost in terms of what exactly is the uh, root cause, I would say, the what exactly is the originating alarm that actually started everything. So, and that is also going to create another situation, which I has mentioned, is the alarm flood situation, where you have a very large quantity of alarms coming in at the same situation, at the same time, and then usually that you have a very, very complex problem, and the operator usually doesn't know how exactly they can actually handle that, and they might easily just miss one particular very, uh, very, very uh, important alarm, and that's probably lost in the, um, within this particular HMI screen, and then maybe it's pushed down um, to, the, to the bottom of the screen, and then they ignore it, and then what happens next is a very serious consequence because of that. Um, and this is also because usually these comes in in a very a uh, short period of time and coming in a very large quantity and these also are the most critical time time critical situation for the operator to actually do anything so by eliminating these kind of redundant or duplicated alarms we can actually help with the situation and one of the key thing to actually read to remove these to act is actually to understand the root cause of these kind of alarms and there's another types of alarms um, that are really, really problematic for the operators as well, which is the which would be the alarms that are without a response. So basically the operator, they don't know how exactly to respond to these alarms. There's no action documented. And uh, maybe it just identify one routine event instead of an abnormal situation. And sometimes it might even be some kind of diagnostic alarms that's not meant for the operator. Instead, it's meant for the maintenance team or may perhaps even meant for the system administrators, not really for the operators, not really for the operations who needs to operate the plant. And alarms itself, as you will see later when we review the definition in the ISA standard, Alarm should always be catering to the operators. It's this not a tool um, main, meant for most other people. It's the main target of alarms are always the operation. So we have to make sure that alarms should always have, a, have an action from the operation to perform, else they should not even be an alarm. And that is the situation with stale alarm or standing alarm a lot of the times. So these kind of alarms, usually they remain there for more than an hour, more than days, and I've seen myself an alarm standing there for more than a year where there's no operator's action, and whenever I ask the operator, they just say that, okay, it's just there. It's just hanging in the background. We don't need to do anything. I don't care about that. It's just something over there, and they don't even understand what exactly it means a lot of times. So these kind of alarms would usually um, just take another place on the uh, place uh, on the alarm state plate, and in a way that it would also um, try to draw the operator's attention. Taking up some space, it might also push other alarms to the bottom of the screen as well, and that creates a lot of problems. 
as you might think. And how exactly we can actually try to eliminate these problems? One of the key things is actually to document the operator's action. So by documenting the operator's action and understanding whether there is actually an action in the first place for the operators, we can easily eliminate these kind of stale alarms. So there are far more uh, problems of alarms. So what I am doing here is just to mainly focus on alarms that have problems that's related with the problems of root cause and also problems with alarms without a response, without outrageous actions. Um, and because um, the time that we have today is really limited, so I'll just focus on these two things because we are, I'm trying to focus on the main two topics today, how exactly we can uh, apply the philosophy from the data science to actually tackle these two types of alarms. So after talking through all these uh, problems of alarms, so what exactly is alarm management? How exactly we can perform this alarm management to help ourselves, to help us to address these kind of problems? So there are a few purposes of alarm management. And very, uh, the first thing that would pop in your head, I would say, is probably to ensure safe operations. But I would say, in my experience, for safe op, while it is very important aspect of alarm management, but safe operations is actually usually handled by the safety system. And that is if you have a safety system. I've been to so many plants that they don't have a safety system, where they only rely on alarm system to, to actually perform all the safety operations. And in that case, you're pretty much stuck with the alarm system alone. But if you have a safety system, that means that your safety system will kick in if something drastic or something disastrous would come in. So in that case, what we try to do is actually try to prevent the activation of the safety system. Because whenever you try to activate the safety system, you will end up with unplanned shutdowns. And you might have damage to equipment, and also you might have some kind of processing incidents as well. Like you have some kind of emission um, that might breach your environmental permits, and then you end up with a fire. So that is usually the case why um, we need uh, the safe, uh, why we need alarm to prevent the activation of a SIS or maybe some other kind of trip or maybe it's like burner management system to prevent these situations. And also the alarm system itself is should be actually a tool to help the operator to perform some kind of roles. This is especially true when we have a batch. Uh, plant, where sometimes they use the alarm to actually indicate when the or when they can actually go into the next phase of the reaction. Like if they're cooking, maybe brewing them, brewing some kind of um, like a beer brew, where they brew alcohol. So they need to keep the temperature maybe at, I would say, 60, 70 degrees C Celsius for a period of time, and then they need to drop it down, uh, cool it down uh, to maybe 30 degrees C for a period of time. And using these kind of alarms, temperature alarms, it would help them to understand when they can actually go into that space. And also, uh, the alarm management itself is being outlined by the standard, and also these kind of standards will help you to uh, basically fulfill or comply with some of the uh, regulations. Based on your um, geography, then if you are in the US, it would be the OSHA PSM that you try to fill and try not to basically bow with that. And also, it would help you with uh, the quality producer uh, quality products. Um, because you might degrade if you have a wrong temperature set when you try to basically do a one. So this is the full, um, I would say, full life cycle in the ISA standard uh, for alarm management. And today we will mostly be focusing on the rationalization because we're trying to look at the root cause and also trying to talk about the uh, 
operators action. And those are the stuff that, that are being discussed in the rationalization where you basically try to document all the aspect of an alarm. And if the alarm doesn't really fulfill some certain requirement, then they will basically be degraded as not an alarm. And the result of that is rationalization is to produce something we call the master alarm database. So according to the standard, an alarm should always follow these three folds of definitions. The first one is that it should be something that's targeting the operative and also catching their attention. It should be an audible or visual mean. And then it should be indicating an abnormal situation, something that is going wrong. And finally, it should need a timely response. If you, it needs an action, and the action should be within a period of time. Um, for example, if you have an action like writing a particular report, um, maybe within a month, then I would really not say that is a proper, proper, proper operator's action because that's not a timely response. A timely response usually is within 30 minutes or within an hour. That's a timely response. And therefore, if we realize that the alarm doesn't fulfill any of the uh, definition right here, we can actually put it as alert, prompt, or message based on how exactly uh, or what kind of condition they are or what kind of uh, actions that they need. And as you can see that um, these kind of alarms, they usually should indicate a malfunction deviations. Um, they also need a timely operator's actions. And in order actually to help the operator to understand what this alarm started from, where it is originated from, we also need to input and also try to investigate what exactly is the root cause for these alarms. And this, these kind of ideas are actually being mandated by the ISA standard, um, especially when it comes to the consequence of inaction and also the operator's action. They are required information by the ISA that is should be within the master alarm database. And this master alarm database should be well kept, well catered, and well maintained as well. And it is also recommended that you put some pauses in, in order to help the operators operate in that sense. So we talked about alarm management, how exactly we can do it. Let's see what kind of steps or what kind of information or philosophy fundamentals that we can borrow from data science in order to help us to flush out these kind of information. Then. So we talked about root cause. And the root cause is also very important in the, in the data science uh, discipline, I would say, um, as I have explained before. According to the definition, it is basically outlining the reason why one particular problem occurs. Um, and within the field of data science or data analytics, they actually use a process that's called five whys to identify that particular cause. So how exactly do they do that? On the paper, it's simply as just asking why five times. It is just to try to actually find out what links up to is the fundamental problem or fundamental reason for your problems. So you, what we want to do is try to ask why repeatedly to unmute the core of the problems. For example, why are you late for work? The first one, why are you late for work? Because I missed the bus. And why did you miss the bus? Because I left the house late. And why did you leave the house late? Because I got up late. And why did you get up late? Because I was up all night. And why were you up all night? That was because my children, my child was ill. And that is the root cause of your problem. And let's see how exactly we can apply that in a process sense, in, in a process. Let's consider that uh, there's a compression session drum here, and there's a high level alarm right here at this LC 101. And there is also a compressor trip 
at this LSH103. Um, and once this switch is activated at on high level, then it would basically trip that compressor. It also has a, a drain valve here, right here, that's controlled by the uh, C101. So now, considering that is a higher level alarm here, let's ask first, why do we have a high level alarm? And actually, believe or not, whenever I ask that question to the operators, this is the answer they get. Because there's high level in the compressor, compressor suction drop. And they just stop there. They don't, they don't think deeper into the answer. So I had to, a lot of time, ask them the second why. So why? Why is there a high level there? That's because the intake is actually higher than the outflow from within this drop. Um, and why is there an imbalance of intake and outflow? That is, one of the reasons could be because you can't drain the vessel. So when I ask this third why, it can actually branch out into different other causes as well. So one of the branch could be because you can't drain the vessel. The other branch could be some kind of offset upstream that would lead to the more flow from the upstream into this particular drop. But let's stick to this can't drain the vessel branch and last, uh, let's ask the fourth one, why? And why can't you drain the vessel? Something wrong with this valve. So the valve is stuck closed so that you can't drain the vessel. And why you have this problem with the valve? It can either be the mechanical problem with the valve itself, the valve fails itself, or it might be the failure of this particular, particular um, controller that actually is telling the valve to close. So there are two different root cause for this particular branch where you can't train the vessel. And that is how exactly you can arrive at that kind of root cause as well. Now, let's take one more step. We have the root cause now. So as you can remember, might remember, I talked about that there were alarms that are without responses, without operating sections, and we that's and that's why we end up with a lot of the standing alarms out there. So within the data science field, um, there that is actually the time that when they use the get analysis. So in the data science field, what they try to do is that um, they have a course for one particular business problem. For example, they can't sell um, a, a blueberry this year. And then they try to breach that particular gap to actually address that problem that they can perhaps sell more of that particular product. So to in order to breach that particular gap, they need to derive different action plan. And these kind of action plan exactly is if we put that in the context of alarm management, is what the operator's action needs to do in order to correct the root cause of the alarm to put that alarm back to the normal situation to basically clear that. Now, let's see how exactly we can do it on that example that we have discussed. So we know that there were two root causes. The first one is uh, the valve failure. So what could be the action on that? So because right now the valve is failing, then in that case, we have to do something with the valve. So we can either manually try to operate the valve in the field, in that sense, because it's right now stuck, so we might need to crank, uh, crank it open or something. Um, and we need to, someone in the field to actually perform that. Um, how about the other reports when, when you have a failure of the controller? To actually help with that situation, you can actually have two different actions depending on how this particular controller fails. For example, if the controller fails in a way that it's just failing its automatic function um, in terms of how the set point is basically uh, set at, then you can actually put that controller in manual and then basically telling the controller that, okay, right now we have a high level situation, we need to close the valve. 
The other thing what you can do is based on the design of your HMI screen, maybe there is a button for this particular valve on the HMI screen on your control system that you can click that can send a signal to the valve that will actuate it and then close the valve from the control system. So that is another action, another way. To and if you don't do these actions, um, by addressing these kind of problems, then the result would be the compressor trip. And that is exactly the consequence of inaction that the mass alarming faces. So as you can see, by understanding the root cause, we can understand how, where these alarms originates from. We can start to divide the action path and then in a way that we can document the operator's action to tell them, to let them know how exactly they can troubleshoot these kind of situations. And as we have mentioned, there were situations where you have a lot of duplicated alarms. Um, by understanding root cause, we can actually eliminate a lot of them already, especially when we have alarms that's within one particular reactor but you have different measurements, like here, you have measurement three, measurement four, because they have the same root cause, then why don't we just take one of the alarm and then silence, basically take out the other alarms, because that is basically a different alarm. Or in some cases, we can actually also use something we call the advanced alarming technique. So that would be something like, uh, uh, doing some kind of programming in order to help the situation. Um, I'm not going to go through in details about advanced alarming techniques because it's, a, it's basically a number of slides for a whole afternoon when it comes to advanced alarming techniques because we are talking about how exactly you can do different programming and do uh, uh, silence some, some kind of alarm based on their state or the state of the operations, or maybe we can do some kind of first out suppression, for example, within a, a compressor trip, then you usually would end up have with a lot of alarms on the discharge and uh, also maybe the inflow, and um, even some kind of vibrations or electrical uh, surge alarms as well. So we try to make Whenever the compressor is stripped, that comes in first and try to basically silent the rest of the alarms. In a sense. So those are a few of the examples for advanced alarming methods. If you guys are very interested in details, how exactly we can do these um, different uh, methods in terms of how we do the advanced alarming techniques and what exactly suppression means, uh, you're welcome to join our uh, courses online. These are the online self-paced training. These basically online courses where you don't really need to follow a schedule. You don't need to do it within a week. Whereas there are also courses which allows you to do that. And these, is, these are the upcoming courses we have um, in the upcoming months within this year, within 2022, that we have courses for uh, like for the uh, IC6111 standards, and also we have some kind of life cycle trainings uh, or maybe machine safety trainings. And usually they are online, and we also do have live courses that is in person. Um, like we have some courses in December that's in our headquarters in uh, Salisville, Pennsylvania, that we have this FSC 100 courses. Um, so, if you guys are interested, um, welcome to uh, send us uh, a question and also welcome to follow us up on Twitter, on Facebook, and we also have a lot of information like the white papers or also reference materials on our website. So, the white papers are really good materials and resources for you guys to actually look up to to look up specific topics, because we try to make them um, like academic papers to address some of the questions or some of the problems that we see during operations. 
and um, and some of them can actually uh, maybe address some of your problems that you see during your operations. So um, we do have a bit of time. So we'd like to see if you guys have any questions um, regarding um, the information that I talked about today. Like how exactly we, uh, how exactly these kind of uh, life cycles are being mandated in terms of management of change or monitoring assessment, how exactly they were done within the ISA step. So. All right, I have, I think I have a question about our tool. Interesting. So, yes, still alarm, yes. So, Sewer Alarm itself, um, Sewer Alarm right now itself is uh, still um, a standalone tool, but we are, have plans to actually build them within the Exelandia suite. Um, but Sewer Alarm itself, the main purpose of it is actually to uh, help you with the, uh, I would say, the rationalization process in a way that um, we can actually because you can outline the flow of how exactly you want to do the alarm rationalization. And the flow and the steps that are listed within the SEAL alarm um, and also rigidly uh, being implemented throughout the interface of the SEAL alarm is actually according, built with the, I would say, with a mindset that was built um, that's screaming back to the ISA standard about what kind of information are needed, what kind of workflow would be best or recommended during the rationalization process. Um, and then we also have different fields that you can fill it in, that is, be basically outlined by the standards, like what is the priorities, what are the cause and consequences, corrective actions. But those are very intuitive ways for you to conduct rationalization. But most importantly, Sewer Alarm itself is also a database because the deliverable for the alarm rationalization should always be an, a, a master alarm database. And for the master alarm database, we need to make sure that any changes, because it's the, all the alarm data within the master alarm database are actually, they are actually being confirmed and they are also being um, processed by everyone in the team in the um, alarm rationalization team, where you have operations, where you have um, process engineers, instrumental, uh, instrumentation engineers, uh, you have control engineers, you have other kind of uh, personnel. So everyone agrees on that. So in that case, um, any kind of changes in this, you actually need to go through the maximum of change. And the SEO alarm software itself is actually trying to help you to make that particular master alarm database to stay static as possible. And that is what I see the main strength of the SEO alarm. You can have any kind of database, even like a SQL database to do alarm rationalization, but you can do very easy changes with them. And they're not really compliant with the IEC or ISA standard. So that kind of a locked-in information or locked-in situation can actually help for the compliance with the ISA standard. Um, so that I hope that answered your question. I do have another another question on um, on some of the data that we show, some of the target within the uh, IS different ISA standards. So, yes, um, so these kind of information, these kind of recommended uh, practice or numbers, um, every time when I finish an alarm rationalization process, I, every plant that I went to after they finish everything, they are easily achievable. 
these kind of duration that they have average alarms about one to two alarms per um, maybe 10 minutes in the ball. And I, a lot of the times I actually would be able to see the number of alarms within the day less than 100 a lot of the times. And the distribution itself is very easily achievable once you start documenting the, operate, uh, the operator's action, whether these are right for alarms or not. So we can actually eliminate a lot of the high priority alarms or the uh, crazy alarms out there. So I would also uh, maybe start another webinar to talk about priority specifically. And these would be um, after you understand how priorities is being selected, you understand how easily it is to actually achieve these kind of numbers for especially for uh, priority distributions. And I hope that answers your question. Um, and I have another question about the rationalization objectives um, process, process. So um, as I mentioned, um, as I've explained through why, uh, how the zero alarm could help, is basically the rationalization, um, the purpose according to the standards, is basically trying to document um, all as much as information for the alarm. The first thing we try to do in during the rationalization is to see whether this alarm is valid. If the alarm is not valid, we just take it out. And then if it's valid, we start to document all these informations. We have the cause, consequences, actions, and also the time to respond, and then we try to select the priorities, and then also to see whether it's, um, uh, what kind of classification it has, and then see whether there's some kind of a maintained schedule specified for these kind of class classifications as well. And then all these would form gradually into a big, a vast alarm database where you try to keep them as static as possible. And why exactly why we need to keep them as static? One of the reasons, as I mentioned, because these are authorized um, alarm attributes that you have. The other thing is during monitoring and assessment process is that you need to um, period periodically compare the alarm setting within your control system and compare them with the mass alarm database to see whether they're are any unauthorized changes within your control system. So if there are any unauthorized changes, then you actually need to go through the management of change to address whether there are extra risk associated with it. And that process is part of the OSHA PSM. And that's why it's very important. If you don't do that, you're breaking the regulations by OSHA. And I hope that would answer your question. Um, I think I don't have enough time. We've been going through more, about more than an hour. So if you guys have more questions, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, my email is basically similar as paul.chen at ixta.com. And uh, I'm happy, very happy to answer any extra questions that you have. And you can also go to our website, check out our white, pa white papers and books and see if there's any extra guidance. Just shoot us an email, we're happy to help. And I'm really, really grateful that you guys come to this webinar. And I hope that you guys have uh, enjoyed the rest of your day and have uh, it, it's nighttime for you guys. Um, please enjoy your evening and have a great night. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time.